Well, good morning. I'm James Rogers. I, I do uh, pasture and range research here at Noble Foundation. What I'd like to visit with you about is a couple of grazing research studies that we have going on at Pasture Demonstration Farm, which is about uh, six miles west of Ardmore here on introduced pasture. One of these studies is a cow-calf study. A second one is a, a, a stalker calf study involving cover crops. So with our cow-calf study, what we're doing is we're wanting to put together different forage systems into one overall system to try and reduce the amount of hay and supplemental feed that it takes to get a cow through the winter. So in doing this, we're comparing two treatments to a control group. Our control group is just simply best management practices. We have Bermuda grass-based pasture. We fertilize it, weed spray it. We run it until we deplete that pasture, and then we feed hay and supplement like most producers are gonna do. What we're measuring in this study is we're measuring cow performance. We're looking at body condition score about three to four times during the year cow weight three to four times during the year, our calf performance at pre-breeding and also at weaning, uh, pasture production, we're monitoring our, our, the forage mass that our pastures are producing throughout the year, and then we're monitoring all our system inputs, fertilizer, weed spray, um, supplement cost, hay cost as well. You know, when we have scenes like this where we're, we're feeding hay for a long period of time, you know, this, this is just not very economical, and it's probably not the best land stewardship practices, practice to do as well. So the treatments that we have, we mentioned our control, that's just kind of a best management practice. Our second one is a stockpile interseed treatment, where we're stockpiling Bermuda grass in the fall with a little bit of extra uh, fertility. And then we're going in and we're interseeding wheat into some of our standing pasture as well. And we're allocating about one acre per cow for the stockpile and then an additional one acre per cow for our inner seed. Our third treatment is also a stockpile where we're stockpiling about one acre per cow uh, Bermuda grass. And then we're also having a dedicated winter pasture area for these cows to time graze and then graze out in the spring. This is just a shot of us interseeding into Bermuda grass. We're not uh, chemically burning down this Bermuda grass prior to interseeding. This particular shot was done in late September, early October. And then this is our spring pasture that we were grazing our cows on uh, this past spring. There's a lot of you know, a bit of environmental effects on these treatments. Every year is a little bit different. The responses that we had last year are certainly different from the responses that we have going on this particular year. This is why we do multi-year experiments. This is a shot of our stockpile Bermuda grass. The quality of this Bermuda grass has been surprisingly good. It's been much better than the hay quality that we've been feeding. We've been monitoring the quality of the stockpile forage uh, throughout the year. We apply about 50 pounds of actual in on these pastures for stockpile in uh, late August, early September, allow them to accumulate till frost and then we turn in. Uh, we've been measuring quality on these Bermuda grass pastures around 12, 13% all winter long. Uh, the first year of the study, we got about um, two, three weeks of grazing on the stockpile. It wasn't a very good fall to accumulate stockpile. But this year, as I mentioned, it's a different year. We're getting about, we've gotten about two months of grazing off of these stockpile pastures. This is a shot of our cows that are grazing uh, wheat interseeded into our Bermuda grass. We started time grazing these cows last January on our interseed treatments. And then once the, uh, the wheat really kind of uh, hit that spring flush, we just turned our cows in and they have full access to wheat for about 30, 45 days prior to breeding. Year one feed, uh, you can see our control. We fed cubes and hay uh, to our cows. Our stockpile and interseed, we only fed cubes about uh, one week and then we switched over and uh, we were feeding a little bit of hay while we were on our interseed as well. Our stockpile winter pasture treatment, you can see that uh, the amount of cubes and the amount of hay that we fed is very similar to our control treatment here. 
Our winter pasture component of this treatment just was really, really late developing last year, and uh, we weren't able to graze it till I think uh, late March. Uh, so it was really late. So that's that's kind of why this one appears the sim same to control. Uh, what was kind of interesting is our stockpile interseed treatment. We had a difference in calf weights at pre-breeding. And this effect uh, continued on to uh, weaning as well, where these calves were a little bit heavier than our other treatments. Second uh, study I'm going to talk about is a, a stalker study where we're integrating a cover crop during, grown during the summer between wheat crops. We want to know what effect uh, this cover crop is going to have on our winter pasture production. We also want to know uh, if we introduce a, a cover crop into our winter pasture system, what effect is that going to have on our soil health? Is it going to improve our soil health? What's it doing to the microbial community? What's it doing to our soil moisture throughout the summer and at the time of planting our, our uh, fall winter pasture? We rely on winter pasture and stocker production for a lot of our economic uh, returns in our production systems here in south central Oklahoma. We want to measure the impact of that summer cover crop on our winter pasture production. We want to monitor our changes in soil health over time. And we also want to see what, what economic advantage, if any, is there going to be to adding a, a summer cover crop into this winter pasture system. The study area is 100 acres at our pasture demonstration farm. Um, about 12, 13, 14 years ago, sometime back, this was randomly divided up into 10 10 acre paddocks. Half of those were in no till production and half of those were in tillage production. What we've done is simply gone in and split those paddocks and, to, and randomly assigned a summer cover crop to one half or the other half. So our treatments are uh, no till winter pasture with no cover crop or no till with a cover crop, tillage winter pasture with no cover crop or with a cover crop. And each treatment's replicated five times. So a lot of power in the study. We'll plant our winter pasture. Typically we like to get it in by September 15th. We'll start grazing hopefully sometime in November, December. We'll come off of these pastures in April or May and then hopefully we won't turn around and get that cover crop planted in May, early June and then we're going to try and graze it uh, sometime, hopefully in June, get about uh, ideally 60 days of grazing on that cover crop. We have soil moisture sensors in each one of our paddocks. We're going to repeat this study at least three years. We're measuring our winter pasture production and our cover crop uh, pasture production, animal performance on both systems, water infiltration, soil bulk density, soil moisture, soil temperature, nutrient concentrations, and then we're working with our plant biology group to monitor soil microbial communities. This is our summer cover crop mix that we're planting. It's a multi-species mix, uh, about 50% broadleaves and the rest grasses, summer annual grasses. You can see millets and corn uh, consist of our grass. I was a little bit hesitant to put in a sorghum sudan. We realized that the sorghum sudans are going to give us a lot more production, but uh, being a nitrate accumulator and a little bit worried about prussic acid and wanting to graze this, that was just one less thing I would have to worry about, so we went with the millets. This is a shot of us. Uh, we come in contact with the soil quite a bit out here in, in this study. Uh, we're out here measuring our soil water infiltration late in the season. This is uh, the water infiltration at the end of winter pasture, just kind of a baseline deal here. And, and while our scale here makes it appear that we've got quite a bit of difference between tillage infiltration and no-till infiltration, there's really very little difference between the two. They're very similar. We planted our cover crop in um, late May to mid-June, depending upon if it was no-till or till. This is just some of our no-till cover crop scenes. This is kind of a contrast between our till, I mean our no-till cover crop and no-till without a cover crop. Here's some of our tillage pasture. We had a difference in composition between tillage and no-till. Um, we had a lot of volunteer grasses coming up into our no-till versus our till was more of, the, of what we planted actually persisted. Water, 
Uh, we had a lot more moisture with our no-till paddocks than we had our till paddocks, and you might want to go out there and take a look at the poster on this. Soil temperature was, was cooler soil temperatures with our no-till paddocks. This is um, infiltration following the summer cover crop. Really no change in our tillage infiltration, no effect here from our cover crop, but our no-till without a cover crop, we had an increase in our, in our water infiltration rates. We measured soil bulk density in December after our uh, winter pasture establishment. Our no-till has higher soil bulk density than our tillage paddocks, so this is a measure of compaction. But at this level here, we're, we're measuring somewhere about 1.5, 1.4, somewhere in there. That's still not at a level that's going to cause us any problems with uh, establishment of our winter pasture. This is what our tillage paddocks uh, looked like at the time of planting, and this is contrasted with a no-till, no-cover crop uh, winter pasture area at planting. This is a flown with a drone uh, after establishment. Uh, you can actually see here kind of some different establishment rates of our cover crop versus the no-cover crop areas, and this is reflected in our production. <clears throat> 